and thank you very much for that very comprehensive opening statement. I would like to echo the sentiments of of the chair in the room uh, in saying that you're very welcome um, to the committee today. And I would like to thank you for taking part in what is a series of um, engagements that we're having around the review of the Good Friday Agreement in this its 25th anniversary. I, I also wish to um, pay tribute and thank you for your role that you played with former Taoiseach Albert Reynolds in agreeing the Downing Street Declaration and the framework documents, um, because as we know and as, a view, as you have articulated very well, they contributed to the Good Friday Agreement some years later. Um, Today I'm, I'm at Westminster. I, I'm not long actually inside from attending a, a protest, a demonstration, along with Bloody Sunday families and protesters in the context of, of the legacy legislation that's working its way through Parliament at present. And I am cognizant of your, of your comments to Emer in, in the last section there. But I would like to take some time to ask you about your time in the British Cabinet. Um, when you were Prime Minister for a substantial period of that time, covering 1987 to 1997. That was a period when um, British intelligence would have been using a, a very high-profile agent called Brian Nelson when he was living. Uh, he had been recruited from West Germany and brought to Belfast to take control of operations um, on behalf of the UDA. It also covered the period of the, the very high-profile killing of, of Pat Finucane, the human rights lawyer, uh, my father, amongst many, many other instances. And it also covered the period where a large consignment of arms were imported from South Africa uh, under the watch of British intelligence, under their watch and direction, um, weapons which were used to significantly escalate and, and triple the killing capacity of, of loyalist paramilitaries. What, what we know now, and as a committee, we, we have spent some time over the last number of years dealing with legacy, but what we know now from investigations and reports by Lord Stevens, as he is now, by former um, Canadian Supreme Court jurist Peter Corey, by Sir Desmond de Silva, both of the latter two now deceased, the scale of collusion between British intelligence organisations and loyalists that was ongoing from the earliest days of the conflict. And indeed, I, I note that uh, Judge Corey and Desmond de Silva both uh, reference in their reports seeing cabinet papers and minutes of meetings between um, ministers and senior government officials. All reports confirmed that collusion existed between the British government's intelligence agencies and loyalist paramilitaries. And, and David Cameron, as he then was prime minister in 2012, personally apologised um, to my family privately, but also very publicly in the House of Commons. Irish uh, society is still dealing with the effects of collusion. It's still dealing with the effects of, of our past. Um, and on your watch, respectfully, I, I would highlight that, that collusion was endemic. We see that from the reports that have taken place. So it's within that context that, that I have some questions. Um, namely, were, were you briefed on, on this strategy? Um, if you weren't, do you find it strange that you weren't? And even in the case of my father, along with many other cases, th there were allegations fairly credible and, and well supported, both domestically and internationally, that there was allegations of collusion being made. Did you ever make any inquiries as to whether there was substance to those allegations? Um, and, and knowing what we know now, um, having watched the, the, the language of David Cameron, who, who talked about when the state's own um, own actors and agents are are in essentially are in the dock, then it's there's an onus on the state, and I, I think an extra onus on the state to ensure accountability and transparency. N knowing what we know now, do you think that you would have done anything differently? Well, I'm I'm, I'm surprised. Well, first you, John, I'm very sorry to hear about the sorry. Um, sorry is an empty word, but. Let me acknowledge that nothing more awful could have happened. Um, and let me say also at the start, one of the great pleasures of the way the peace process concluded was the fact that Sinn Féin are sitting amongst the democratic parties and are open for election and are now getting themselves elected in the north and in the south and have become a bona fide democratic political party. That is an outcome that I thoroughly welcome and one we were hoping to see throughout the process. I am surprised at the 
comments you make about collusion between the intelligence agencies and the loyalist paramilitaries because there was a I'm puzzled. I was certainly never briefed on that. I certainly wasn't aware of either of the things you mentioned, arms for South Africa or indeed anything else. I wasn't briefed of them then, and nor have I been briefed in the papers I have seen subsequently. Now, I know how these things arise. I don't know whether your information is accurate and whether the people who've written about this are accurate or whether there is more to it than it seems. But I do know it emphatically was not the policy uh, that I was aware of, either as uh, foreign secretary uh, or later as prime minister, that there was any such collusion. That's not something that I was aware of. I, I don't know exactly what uh, David Cameron may have said. And I will look up and see what David Cameron said to see how far it goes and whether it does actually provide a clear intimation of collusion, in which case I would certainly deplore it. It certainly wasn't something of which I was aware. Now, there was a great deal on both sides of the border, north and south, of uh, discussion between some politicians, not Westminster politicians, but Irish politicians north and in the south, uh, with the paramilitary bodies. I think that is uh, certainly beyond doubt. But the intelligence agencies is a proposition, I must say to you, I'm much less certain about. I can make inquiries, but uh, I don't think that helps anybody very much at this stage. But I can certainly tell you that I was certainly not briefed about it. So I certainly didn't actively approve of it because I wasn't aware of it. The, um, I, I had maybe, and I say this respectfully, I had maybe assumed um, a, a little more informed knowledge on this. So, so I will clarify uh, and, and just set out the basis on which I made those comments. David Cameron's statement to the House um, was on the 12th of December 2012. Um, it came at the end of a process in which a former um, a, a senior barrister called Desmond De Silva had been appointed by the, the what was then the coalition government between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats um, to review the papers in my father's case. That, that came after um, a report by the former Canadian Supreme Court jurist Peter Corey, who was appointed post-Western Park peace talks. Uh, and that came after the appointment of John Stevens, who, who actually would have been appointed at, at, at not by you, but would have been appointed on, on your watch. Initially, he carried out three investigations into allegations of collusion in, in the North. His first in, investigation took place whenever he was, I think from memory, um, either assistant chief constable or constable, uh, or chief constable, sorry, of Cambridgeshire um, Police. And then his third report took place whenever he was in charge of the Met. He was Britain's most senior police officer. Um, the findings of those reports are, are what I'm quoting. Um, it, it is not necessarily my own um, interpretation or words that are being used, but all three of those independent analyses have confirmed that collusion took place, not just in, in the murder of my father, but, but right across the board. The, the importation of shipment of arms, again, is something that, that, that is very much a matter of record th through the, the, the very courageous work of investigative journalists, um, along with the, the, the reports that I have cited. And in the context of, um, I, I think following on a little bit from Emer's comments, um, I don't think anybody respectfully would want you to comment on what is or what would be private conversations, but the legacy debate is very much out in the open. Um, there is nothing secretive uh, going on. There is no negotiation taking place. Um, my family, along with many other families, have fought for decades and any success that we have had has been in spite of, not because of the actions of successive British governments, whether that is through um, reports being published or court cases being won. But what we face at present is a piece of legislation which will 
withdraw the ability for families. And I say this about families, irrespective of where their loss derived, whether that is as a result of state actions, Republican actions, or loyalist actions, because that, because that needs to be spelt out. Irrespective of how they suffered their loss, this piece of legislation will remove their right to have an inquest, will remove their right to use the services and offices of our police ombudsman, will remove their right to initiate civil proceedings, and will remove their right to see anybody brought before a criminal court uh, and, and face justice for the actions that he or she carried out uh, to the requisite standard that, that our criminal courts demand. So, so this is what is currently before the courts. Rather uniquely, this piece of legislation has united every single political party on the island of Ireland, bar none. I don't need to tell you what a difficult task that is, but this piece of legislation ha has achieved that. Um, to my knowledge, no political party in Britain supports this legislation, bar the Conservative Party. It has been condemned at a European level, Committee of Ministers structures, as not being Article 2 compliant. It has been condemned by human rights organisations, United States Congress, and you know the list, the list goes on and on. So in the context of families, in some cases, fighting for over five decades for the simple right of an inquest, I would invite you to pass some comment about such a draconian piece of legislation um, that has been described, and I would share this description as unamendable. No legislation. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make the point uh, to, to John Fernook, and if I may, uh, with respect to our guest today, he, he has been invited uh, to talk about his work in the peace process and the issues leading up to the Downing Street Declaration, the Good Friday Agreement. Now, he's already answered a question uh, from Senator Cordy in relation to the matters you're raising. And I just want to point out that, that, uh, you know, that he, has, he has made his point on that. And I don't want, obviously, you're entitled to say what you wish here. Uh, but I just want to point out that to, to Sir John that he has already given an answer uh, and I, I, look, it's a matter for himself to reply, but uh, the chair is here to make sure that our guests, uh, that we concentrate what we asked him to, to know about his personal knowledge and his work as a prime minister. So it's over to Sir John there, but I just well, want if, to point if, out if that. I could, if I could just respectfully yeah. respond to that, Chair. Yeah. Um, uh, I, the, the committee has spent a considerable amount of time on legacy. We have, of course, uh, victims I think, are referred I think, to in the Good Friday look, Agreement. I, I, I'm and, not going to fight for that. Sorry, sir, sir, no, no, hold just, on a second, I'll John. Be, it's difficult with the time delay on, 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 the, on the link here. Yeah, well, um, I'm very sorry sir about John, that. Sir John, yeah. in his opening statement, did reference the fact that he'd met yeah. victims from time to time yeah. and did reference about the importance of ensuring that violence didn't go on. His opening statement referenced the fact that uh, the police and army didn't murder or kneecap or carry out bombings. And, and I, I do res very respectfully disagree yeah. with the analysis that, that he can't comment right. on legacy on the basis that it's a negotiation. I just wish to, sure, to that, politely correct that assertion yeah. and, and invite comment in the context of where victims sit in the process of um, not marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. It is within that context that I've made those comments. Sure. Well, thank no, you for that. No, no, I fully understand. Um, uh, and no doubt if I were in your shoes, I would raise exactly the same points, given the impact that it had on your family. The point I'm trying to make is that, well, two points, really. Firstly, I did make clear when I agreed to attend the committee that I could only discuss what I had been responsible for before 1997. I, I can't really comment on legislation that I've not been part of framing, that I haven't read it for, that I'm not on the committee discussing, that I'm not in the House of Commons hearing, uh, and about which I have no detailed knowledge whatsoever. The only knowledge I have of the bill is the fact that it's going through the House of Lords and such small amounts as have occasionally appeared in parts of the British media. So I would be commenting from a considerable lack of knowledge and I just do not think that is a safe thing for anyone to do. I could say something either that caused deep offence, which I certainly wouldn't wish to do on such a delicate subject as this, or I could say something that was staggeringly stupid simply because I did not know the background and do not know the facts. 
And that is uh, really my point. I was surprised at what you said, what you implied, asserted, uh, had happened during the period when I was Prime Minister. And I said to you in terms and repeat again, I certainly was not aware, was not briefed uh, upon that. But I'm absolutely not briefed. It is over 20 years since I left Parliament. I absolutely am not briefed. I'm not unsympathetic. And I entirely agree with the fact that it is healthy that these things are now being considered and discussed. And, and I hope accommodations with it can, can be reached as far as possible. Some of them may be very, I can see that some of them may be very difficult to deal with. Uh, not least because of the length of time that has elapsed between the event and now. But I really would be very unwise to comment on things about which I have so little knowledge, which was why I made that point. I had to spend some considerable time reminding myself of the events that took place when I was Prime Minister. It is now 32 years since I became Prime Minister and 25 years since I ceased to be Prime Minister. So in that time, there's a lot of life to be lived, a lot of things to happen. Uh, and I had to go back and remind myself and rebrief myself of all that had happened in that period. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing and perfectly content to respond to those where I can. But I really am not in a position to respond to things that have happened 25 years after I left Parliament. I think in fairness... I'm sorry, I know from your point of view that must be disappointing, and I, I don't wish to disappoint. If I were in a position to answer the question, I would, but I'm not. In fairness uh, to our witness, uh, I completely concur with the points you've made. You were asked to speak about particular issues, and that's, we're very happy that you're doing that.